Sup? So, a while back when the news broke that Terry Funk died, I actually wanted to make a tribute video to him. And what did I do? I just, you know, print up the camera and just started conveying my experience and my thoughts and everything with Terry Funk. By the way, Terry Funk, rest in peace. To all the family and loved ones, my condolences. And literally the next day, right after work, I want to start editing, you know, just tweak something to make so that way I can have it uploaded to YouTube to pretty much have it be seen. That's when the news broke that Bray Wyatt had passed. And I was like, oh, my, wow, that's just insane. So I was like, OK, I, I'm going to might as well do a tribute video f for Bray Wyatt. But then I started thinking, wait, should I make them two separate videos? Because I don't want to overshadow the other one. But then I was like, maybe it would make sense because I'm good at doing transition to just do the tribute for both of them and make it easy peasy. And I figured I'd do that instead. So I already knew all the stuff about Terry Funk. Like if anybody were to talk to me about Terry Funk and, you know, whatever, I would just unload. So I was like, okay, let me scrap it and make a whole new video because it, it was no big deal. I wasn't tired, you know, from work. And... I just did the video. Then, of course, you know, I didn't do it the next day to do the editing because that work day was extremely busy at work. But the day after, that's when I was like, all right, cool. I can do the editing. And that's when the new Bob Barker died. And I was like, oh, goodness. <laughs> okay. Now, Bob Barker has nothing to do with wrestling. He did show up in an episode or two involving wrestling. But there's more to him that I was just like, okay, you know what? I'm going to make the video for him, probably make it separate. So I'm going to, you know, finish this editing. And then, of course, I was just like, okay, let me at least set up a time frame or whatever for Bob Barker to do a tribute video for him. But then the whole AEW fiasco stuff happened over that weekend where I was just like, huh. Now... I'm going to do a separate video on that because for those of you that don't know, I have a strong educational background in law, in both, you know, in terms of business law, criminal law, and all those other stuff involving law, you know, it just, there was a time I, re I was hardcore wanting to be a lawyer and a judge, and when I say hardcore, I mean like very seriously. But then I found out there was better opportunities without me having to stress or whatever. But anyway, that's a, you don't need to know, worry about that. But there's a lot I can unpack for, on AEW about the whole situation that happened from there involving CM Punk and everything else. And it's not just for that weekend. We're talking like there's a whole lot that I can unpack. And I will do a separate video on that because... Like I said, I mean, I have a strong educational background with law, and there were some things that CM Punk can very much sue for, but at the same time, there are some things that I understand as a business company, what the company can um, allocate for themselves in terms of self-defense or to counter or whatever. But from, you know, they're just a lot, so I'm going to do a separate video. Let me put it that way. And I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to wait it out until all the information comes out about that fiasco because I didn't want to just jump on and start saying stuff without getting all the fact, without getting all the information, without gathering all that stuff to where I can actually make an honest opinion, thought, and, you know, knowledge about what I see going on and what should happen, you know, so on and so forth. But, again, that's going to be a separate video. However, in this video, you know what? Let me just say this. When I was a kid, I freedom, just pure freedom. I was a kid. I had toys. I had music, martial arts. You know, all that stuff was in my life. One of the thing is, though, I also have sisters and mom who love, and I mean love, soap opera I hate that damn thing and I have reasons for it because imagine you got the TV for yourself you're watching cartoon 
I was watching stuff like Transformer, Voltron, GoBots, you know, list goes on and on and on. I was in the mood, and the thing is, I always had to wake up extremely early just to have the TV to myself, because either my mom or my sister will literally push me to the side because they're older than me, and just switch the TV to soap opera. I hate soap opera. I was forced to watch a couple of them damn episodes, and tell them, I'm telling you straight up, they're boring as hell. I don't get it. I don't care for it. It's what I was told from my sis. One of my sisters was, "You gotta watch it. It'll teach you about relationship and how to deal with you know blah 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 blah." No, it's trauma that has nothing to do with me. It's boring as shit. So. But I didn't say that I was a little kid. And if I were to say that, woo, the whooping I would have gotten. So anyway, but that was pretty much my attitude. So I remember one time I finally was like, oh, they're done watching TV. I got the TV now. I can watch TV and watch what I want. I was flipping the channel, trying to find something to engage me. I was flipping. I'm like, is there any cartoon? Is there anything, you know, for me to just like... You know, I don't care. I watched Silverhawks if I have to. Dinosaurs, it was good. But, you know, it's just, I was just flipping the channel. I wanted some engagement. I saw commercials. I saw shit that was boring. I saw things that was just like, uh, don't care. And I just kept flipping. Then I remembered. As I was flipping the channel, there was a man, a grown-ass adult, on a, what I thought was a stage, but it turned out to be a ring, you know, because there was ropes and everything. It just, the way the camera was held. And a ridiculously tall dude. And I heard the commentator said, Andre the Giant. And I was just like, but my stupid ass was still on that, you know, remote, flipping channels. And I flipped away the channel. And I was like, oh shit, wait, hold on. And I tried to go back, and it was like he was Andre the Giant was no longer on the TV. But eventually, I finally discovered that it was WWF. You know, thanks to complain about it at school, and my teacher was like, "Oh, WWF." And I I didn't know what the show was called, but I remember seeing the you know the symbol. So I wrote it on the board, and I asked what the hell that is, and everybody was like, "Oh, that's WWF." So I was like, that stuck in my mind. Andre the Giant introduced me to wrestling. I, well, I mean, I've seen him a couple more times, and I became a huge fan because this, this is a big dude. Like, you know, he dwarf regular sized dude. You know, I'm a little kid. I'm like, whoa, an actual fucking giant. You know what I mean? It's like it was cool. So, of course, I started getting into you know what I was seeing on TV. Now, also at that time. Big into martial arts. So to me, I didn't really see wrestling as... I mean, I understood they, what they were doing was different. But at the same time, I was recognizing, hey, they that's from martial arts. Hey, I know what that is. You know, what, you know my background. And now it's, you know, like Bruce Lee, Jack, you know. I mean, I still got old school VHH, te- um, VHH tapes of old martial arts movies. You know, the one where you see the guy's lip moving. But the English dialogue doesn't seem to keep up. <laughs> but I still love it, though. You know, the whole, you know, the noise when they kick, you know, that clap, back, you know. You guys know what I'm saying. I mean, Wu-Tang even um, came out with a couple. Well, they helped produce or, you know, help show. But I was big into that, too. So I'm watching wrestling. I'm like, dude, they took that from Bruce Lee. Or they took that from, you know, there was so much. But I was just engaged. And... Wrestling sort of like, you know, it didn't take over, but it just became like bonded with me as much as I was into so many other things. It was just, oh, here's another thing I'm into. So I started meeting other people that were into that. Like, I didn't know there was a thing called tape trading until I met this one guy and his room was just like all VHH tap. I don't know why I'm getting tongue tied. All VHH, uh, VHS tapes of wrestling nothing but wrestling all of them wall to wall and I was like did you buy all of these he's like no 
I take Trey. And I was like, oh. And he's like, sometime I will, you know, because he had that fancy um, VHS that will, you know, record and he could create tape and he'll do it for people and it's like a trade up. I don't have to get into his business, but that was his thing. And that's when, I mean, I knew about WWF at the time when they were called WWF, WCW, but I didn't know anything about, like, the territories. I wasn't aware about, you know, other companies like NWA and stuff like that until I met this dude. And, you know, it was, that's when pretty much I learned about Terry Funk. Terry Funk, to me, is not just a wrestler, because, you know, he is, but this is one of those type of guys where, and I'm, you know, I'm up getting up there in age, I've gotten older, but this is one of those guys where I legit, and I mean legit, can say, what you see on TV is who you're going to get when you meet in real life. He was pissed off. He had a branding iron. He didn't give a fuck. And I just was just like, whoa. Who's that? Oh, that's Terry Funk. He crazy. No, no. He just want to fuck people up. That's, that's. Woo. Hulk Hogan better not meet him. That was just my reaction. It was just like, now I wasn't a big Hulk Hogan fan. But he was, uh, you know part of that realm, you know, I knew his existence, but it was just like, that's what I was like, whoa, he, you know, that looked like the type of guy that, you know, it made me, it so made me recognize how, like, the different lens of how wrestling is, the way Terry Funk portrays it, and then how, like, Hulk Hogan, Big Boss Man, Ultimate Warrior, you know, the list goes on and on, how they portrayed it. And it was like vastly different. And but to me, Terry Funk was just like he was just somebody you just don't want to mess around with. He had the voice, he had the demeanor, the size. He was more like a brawler, but you can tell he also knows some technical wrestling. He he just don't want to pull it out unless he feels like it. And he was also very, very agile and stuff. I've seen some stuff he did in Japan, and we, like I said, my friend, I don't know if he still has those tapes, or he, he probably does, he's more of a hoarder, but, you know, I we haven't talked to each other in years, this was like way back in college, but anyway, I was just like, wow, this is intense, this is immense, I loved it, I could, I would love to see Terry Funk versus Brett the Ant-Man Hart, I would love to, you know, it was like, the matches I could envision. Now, I don't know if he asked, they had matches or anything in the past. They probably did. I didn't get that far back. But it was just like, wow. Then ECW happened. Late, I think it was a Friday night. Might have been early Saturday morning. You know, it was still nighttime. I didn't go to sleep, so it counts. So, it was still Friday night. Real late as hell, I saw ECW. First time. And I was just like, oh, this is different. I remember seeing Shane McMahon throw down a heavyweight title and call it ECW Extreme Championship Wrestling. I was just like, oh, okay, this is different. And, of course, obviously because of the wrestling show and everything, I sort of became a fan of that. When Terry Funk joined the roster, instantly I said, oh, shit, everybody's going to die. That was my initial reaction to Yes, he was an old man at that time, but I see what he can do. Everybody was going to die. That was my instant reaction. I was like, oh, Terry Funk's here. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. That was just like, you know, it's just, but it's like, I've seen him get booed. I've seen him get cheered, but he had this way where it's like his presence, it doesn't, dem not only demands respect. It's automatically given to him. You can tell just by, you know, as soon as you see him, when he just looks at you, you're just like, you just want to shake his hand and you just, you know, give him that respect, give him that token. And it was just like the matches that he'd done. I remember 
when ECW did their first pay-per-view, there was a barbed wire match involving Terry Funk. I want to say Sabu was in it. And, um, fuck, 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 I'm losing the third person. I'm losing. But the match was going on and on. At that time, I didn't have a job. I was somewhat broke. And it was on pay-per-view. There was no way I could watch it. But my sister, my oldest sister at the time, was working for the, the a di- no longer existing cable company. But she was like, hey, you know, I work for this company. I can get you that, you know, pay-per-view if you want. I, you know, she'd get it for, on a cheap or I think it was for free. I don't remember. And I was like, yeah, totally. Went over her house. And she wasn't into wrestling. She was, she's aware of it existing because, of you know, I would watch it. Same thing with my other sister. Like, my whole family pretty much, you know, sometimes they'll watch it with me. Sometimes they'll just whatever. But when she saw Terry Funk, I re- ne- I'll never forget her reaction. It was in the middle of the ring or maybe to the side. The camera had the best shot. Dude wrapped the barbed wire around Terry Funk's neck. And you just saw gushes of blood just pouring down and my sister was like oh shit like she she was just like and then I was like yeah yeah and she was like that motherfucker better win after all that bullshit and I was like you know it was just, it was just cool and it was just uh and then seeing him go the whole chainsaw charlie thing I knew it was Terry Funk the moment he got out the box Cause it was like, come on, but I was happy anywhere he go. I was just happy for him because this is Terry fucking Funk. You don't, he don't play around. And of course, you know, years goes up and the old, you know, he gets older and it just, you know, he he definitely made a huge impact in the world of wrestling. I mean, this guy coming from a wrestling family. Like his, with his brother Dory Funk and his father um, Dory Funk Senior, I didn't know about them, but because of the tape, my friend, you know, with the, all them VHS tapes, they, it's like I, sort of, I mean, I was like, oh, this family is kind of cool, but I always sort of connected more with Terry Funk because to me he presented himself like, look, I'm I could be a nice guy, I could be. I could be cool, but if you fuck with me, thank you. <laughs> That's the attitude he had. It's like he he could be cool, he could be laid back and chill. He can you know like he willing to give you a high five, hug, you know all that stuff. But if you mess with him, he's happy. <laughs> you know, it's just like like I said, that's just how I saw it with Terry Funk, and that just made me respect the whole Funk family because in that dynasty, in that world. It just, that's the type of impact that I feel wrestling sort of don't capture anymore. That connection, that, oh my, like, you know, when you see him, if you were to meet him, what you see on TV is what you get in person. And I feel like there's there's a few superstars that can convey it, but nobody can really existentially be it you know what I mean and it's just you know Terry Funk was a true wrestler and I think that's all because of family and when you have wrestling as part of your family you know like actually doing it performing it you know traveling it it will leave leave an impact to others I mean look at the Wyndham's Um, well the Rotunda actually the Rotunda's Everybody should know by now, IRS produced Bo Dallas and Bray Wyatt, even though they're both the Rotundas. They have a pretty much a wrestling family. I don't want to say dynasty, but they have a lineage involved in wrestling. And here's the thing. When I was introduced to Husky Hair, I mean, I knew FCW existed, but at the time I worked, the hours that FCW would show I either didn't have the channel or I was, every time they come on, I'm either still at work. So by the time I get home, I just see end credit. So I never really got the opportunity or chance to really witness or see FCW. So 
but I was aware about the rotundas, I, Bo Dallas and Wyndham and everything. But Husky Harris, I actually thought was, oh, he's not like this big six-pack muscle-bound bodybuilder dude. To me, I looked at him like, oh, this could be like the next Big Boss Man. Or, I mean, Big Boss Man was fit, but, you know, he, he you know... Or this could be like, you know, not King Kong Bundy, but, you know, somebody that can be a threat of that size and also that fucking speed and agility. Dude, like, dude, WWE, you know, because they became, they lost the WWF thanks to World Wildlife Federation Foundation. But, dude, I can see things happen for him. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, give him a good, you know, husky hair. I was like, you know what? He's different, and I kind of dig it, and I was, like, you know, interested in it. But then, of course, like I said, when the whole NXT thing happened, you know, once FCW turned to NXT and all that stuff, I was able to see snippets of it, but I never truly followed it because, again, at the time, the hours I would work at at my job versus the time frame they would show on the TV. But every now and then, I do get the opportunity to see snippets in here and there or whatever. So... I was aware of Bray Wyatt. And I was like, oh, this is like some Cape Fear shit. Like some, um, what's that dude? Oh, God. Curling White? You know, it's, remind me of that. It's just that, oh, except this is like from the swamp. And you can t see, tell it's not just a swamp, but there's some, the way he talked. He talked like as if he tried to express some hypnotizing voodooism. And it was just like there was so much in there. And the whole Wyatt family, I was just like, ooh. If they put him in the main roster, they got to be serious with that group. Because this is one of those... Because WWE can take something that's amazing in NXT. Once I finally was able to watch more of it. Can take something that's amazing in NXT. Take him to the main roster. And turn him into shit. Why? Like, it, that's, that was the thing that puzzled me. Triple H, I will always say, stop letting them go. You know your father-in-law going to fuck it up. Stop it. But it, it happens, you know. It is. But they actually brought him up and they left him alone in a little bit with the whole Wyatt family. And I feel like they should have done a lot with that crew. But... The time frame they had, at least it, they survived a bit longer than The Shield. Because that was very, very, very dumb for it. I'm cutting it that short. But, you know. I wasn't part of the creative team, so I can't really say much. But then, you know, he became the eater of world. And then he started prophesizing stuff. And there were some hidden messages when he do his promo. If you really paid attention to what he was saying... um. Each words he was saying, there was like, not a Kodak, but there was a certain meaning behind his word. But you really got to listen for it. You really got to understand. It's like, it's, it's chaotic poetry said in such a beautiful, smooth way. Kind of like, like, oh, it's like looking at the world. Where everything's going to become apocalypse. But instead of looking at the danger of it all. Because somebody explained it to you. Or the visual of it. You're like. Ah oh, this looks beautiful. It's like. It's kind of like that. He conveying danger in ways. And lurking. But the way he say. He say it in such a subtle way. Where it's like. It's not going to make your skin crawl. But by the time you figure it out. It was already too late. That's what I'm talking about. It was like it was that it was that cool. And it just I enjoyed that. And then all of a sudden he started doing things because I'm I'm a huge fan of horror until Hollywood started fucking it up over the past years where nothing's scary and nothing's coherent and it seemed like they lost creativity in the genre of horror. You know, scary movies, you know, all that stuff. It, it's like sometimes they had the potential 
and then they drop the ball right in front of you, but still expect you to like it, and you're just like, what? So, but what he was doing, he was doing that old school type horror theme, and that's when the whole Firefly Funhouse was born. The way it was such a kiddie show, it was like, you know, watching this episode of, you know, being a good neighbor, except the host is demented. And it got people guessing. It even got me guessing. It's like, okay, I'm trying to understand this character. Is he like in a nut house? And this is what he's portraying? Or, you know, all this and everything else. It got me engaged. And again, it was something that Bray Wyatt was doing with the way he used words and how he engaged it. It's the same thing like he was doing when he was doing the whole swamp cult leader thing. He's conveying, me well, more in either a world, he was conveying messages in such a nice way. It's very chaotic and disruptive, but the way he say it, it's like, if you're not paying attention, you it will go past you. But once you catch it, you're like, oh, it's already too late. And, I, you know, it's the same reaction. It's like, he, and then when he say, let me in, there's more meaning to that. I mean, now, but it wasn't just a catchphrase. He just... There was more to it. It's like, you know, I was a huge fan of Undertaker. Still is. And one of the reasons why I'm a huge fan of Undertaker is because that horror theme, that scariness, that Grim Reaper type death feeling, that feeling like you watch um, Hellraiser. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, well, the good Hellraisers. I don't want to put on the crappy ones. But you, we all know what we're talking about. Yeah. So, it's just... You don't see that much anymore. That's something, you know, I don't want to give myself away when, because, again, I'm starting to become a talent and stuff like that in the world of wrestling to pretty much give my homages to all the wrestlers and my thank you to the ones in the past, but sort of doing it in my way. Not in a trying to be another person, but in my way, being me. So... But it was just like, in that sort of genre, that characteristic, that's something that's more like where my mindset is. And then The Fiend, oh. The Joker's last joke. I have the comic somewhere, but it's like, you know, it just, the mask, the, the dreadlock, I mean, it just, everything, just, every, and he used to have his own, like, Episodes, you can see him on WWE um, in the YouTube where he would do like scary themes or tell scary stories or whatever. And, oh, they were good. Really, really good. It kind of made you feel like this is the his version of Are You Afraid of the Dark? You know what I mean? It was just it was good. So... That's what Bray Wyatt was, you know, conveying for me. And I felt more connected with that because that's sort of like where, like I said, me. I mean, if you see my one introduction video of my wrestling persona, the video is called Hello. If you see that, you'll sort of see a glimpse of me. So... But other than that, it just, it sucked that he passed. And from my understanding, now that it's been a while back, they said there were certain causes of death and, you know, yeah, that sucked. But still, you can definitely tell after the way they did the tribute on SmackDown, he, even though the Bray Wyatt he conveyed to all of us, but behind the scene, this is a man that was providing for his family. This is a man that was going to be there for his friend. This is a man that just want to make people laugh, be happy, feel whole. And that's what I learned from that tribute video. Now, a lot of people may question 
his wrestling and everything. I mean, I'm sorry. The Fiend versus Seth Rollins in that Hell in a Cell killed Hell in a Cell for me. I, Hell in a Cell was my favorite, was my favorite stipulation match of all time. And WWE fucked it up. Grand style right there in front of me to the point where it's like, I I mean, nowadays they could promote a Hell in a Cell and I'll be like, eh. Oh, I want to face you in Hell in a Cell. It's going to get fucked up anyway. Like, it, WWE legit killed my love for Hell in a Cell. And I'm not joking. And it that match, that pretty much was the final nail in the coffin. But, like I said, it sucked that he died, especially so young. Because I was hoping once I break in, into the wrestling world. I will at least have some sort of... I mean, I'm not saying guarantee I'm going to meet all these guys up front. I mean, of course, I'm going to gotta work my way, struggles, and got to make my progress because, you know, I don't look at anything like hardship. I look at it as progress. But, you know, hopefully eventually get there where I could be like, oh, Bray, dude, yes, nice to meet you, you know, all that other stuff, but in more of a business setting. So, yeah, I mean, wrestling laws, I mean, a lot of people look at Terry Funk like he's a hardcore legend. Look, yeah, he did some hardcore matches, but there was more to him than the hardcore element. There was story. There was reasons of his actions. Something that nowadays it seems like when they have hardcore matches, they just doing shit just to do shit, where for Terry Funk, he had meaning, and you could see it. You could feel it. And to me, it's like Terry Funk really brought in that element of wrestling, of the grittiness, the real reality of a wrestler. And I'm going to miss that. Of course, he retired, finally retired. And then, you know, I saw that video when Mick Foley visited him in his um senior home. And even though he was all smiles and everything, and I was happy for him, I was just like, man, Terry Funk. It's like I don't want to accept the fact that he's old because to me, Terry Funk is ageless. I mean, even though, yeah, he was getting older in front of my eyes, I'm not going to lie, when he was wrestling, but it was just like he's timeless. You know what I mean? It's just, and the fact that he passed, I just felt like, man. The memories I have of him from watching those VHS tapes, the memories of all the things he was saying, it was like, Terry Funk, like, like I said, he's the type of guy that I can look at and be like, ah, hi, Terry, so these are your victims. You know what I mean? <laughs> um... And for Bray Wyatt, he died so young, 